All right, so today we're going to be talking about the 12th plateau from Je Deleuze in Felix Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus. This is titled 1227 Treatise on Nomadology, The War Machine. This plateau in particular has a lot of similarities to other politically oriented plateaus, such as the one on faciality or the one on micropolitics and segmentarity. And especially the latter of those is going to bear a lot of similarities to this, where they're trying to bring the theory that they've talked about so far into more of a political landscape so they can talk about how exactly do things get solidified? How does creative potential get um, absorbed? And they're going to make a dichotomy here between the state and the state apparatuses that maintain it and the war machine as something which is extrinsic to the state and which is acting like a, a constant deterritorializing force which the state has to um, try to prevent from happening too quickly. And the way this is structured is they have a number of axioms and propositions and problems that they introduce, and they're going to use this to guide their discussion. So the first axiom is that the war machine is exterior to the state apparatus. And they're first going to talk about this by using some examples um, from mythology, epics, dramas, and games. And I like the one that they have here between Go and Chess. Now, everyone in the West knows what chess is, right? But Go is a slightly different game. Um, it's on a board which is basically like a coordinate plane. It's got vertical and horizontal lines, just like a, um, a chess board does. But in the chess board, your pieces go not on these lines, but in the spaces between the lines. So each piece is always kind of boxed in in this very definite space. And in Go, the pieces are these small little stones. They're even called stones. Um, they're not these like concrete, you know, they're not horses or castles or kings or queens or anything. They're just, they're all stones. And they go along these lines and basically your goal is to um, encompass the most of the enemy's pieces via encirclement and this is going to entail of course some different strategies and they're basically saying here that the problem with chess is that the pieces are coded they have an internal nature and intrinsic properties from which their movements, situations, and confrontations derive. So the chess pieces, the movements that are available to them are already there. You know, a bishop can only go diagonally as many spaces as it wants in one go, um, provided there's no piece in front of it. A uh, knight can only go in an L pattern, you know, two one way and then one to the one to either side, or the king can only move one space in any direction. And they say go pieces, in contrast, are pellets, discs, simple arithmetic units, and have only anonymous, collective, or third-person function. It makes a move. It could be a man, a woman, a loose, an elephant. Go pieces are elements of a non-subjectified machine assemblage with no intrinsic properties, only situational ones. And that's something that they find appealing about a game like Go, is we see two levels of concretion occurring here. One which we can almost see as a sort of imperial state sort of game, where the pieces have very definite hierarchical functions and you know the objective is specifically to get to this one piece namely the king and um, encircle it and strategize against it such that you bring it down whereas in go these pieces are always 
a molecule among others. They don't have a specific function that is any different intrinsically than any of the others. But they do entertain these situational relations where suddenly one stone will become a centerpiece in this collective practice of encirclement, whereas at other times it will be completely inconsequential to the current moves that you're entertaining. Um, at other times it will be the downfall of the whole um, situation as you've been encircled by your opponent. But they say that a go piece only has a milieu of exteriority or extrinsic relations with nebulas or constellations according to which it fulfills functions of insertion or situation such as bordering, encircling, shattering. So once again, these go pieces only have an identity as a function. There is no way in advance in which one piece is distinguished from another, but rather in the way in which they are used, in the functions that they in, uh, fulfill, in the ways that they insert themselves into a particular situation. And this is very reminiscent of micro versus macro politics that they talked about um, in the plateau I mentioned earlier, where a macro politics is going to tend to these very formalized functions and hierarchies, whereas a micro politics is always going to be this force that operates situationally and has the potential to change things and as such is it is attempted to be encircled and captured by the macro politics, or they also call this the macro face in the faciality plateau. Or here they're going to call it imperial science as we go on later. But the point is that these forces which are allowing for change always pose a threat to these formalized, semiotic, molar, administrative forms which is chess or the state apparatus. Whereas when we contrast these to go, we see a strategic, a situational, a relational, an ambiguous and strategic game, which is going to always have a little bit of play. It's never going to be able to be fully um, taken up by the state. And they're going to show how this sort of method of action and organization, it's not really organization at all in the sense of making an organism. This is sort of like when they talk about the body without organs being opposed to organization, to being made an organism. Here, there's merely this situational movement that doesn't try to construct itself into these solid static forms like the state with its hierarchies and its ways of functioning. They say, in Go, it is a question of arranging oneself in an open space, of holding space, of maintaining the possibility of springing up at any point. The movement is not from one point to another, but becomes perpetual without aim or designation, without departure or arrival. The smooth space of go as against the striated space of chess. The nomos of go against the state of chess. Nomos against polis. And that word nomos, I mean, we see this today in the word autonomy, meaning self-motion. Nomos meaning motion. So here, go is defined by this constant situational motion. And the goal of the game is to strategically effectuate the collective motion that defines the game. Whereas chess is a little bit more segmented into these definite interactions between two pieces or whatever. Whereas go pieces don't really work like that. You can't turn them into these molar forms that operate on a large scale in a continuous sweep, but rather chess is going to tend to cover up those creative possibilities that can be experienced 
via this smooth space. And this is one of the most important parts of this plateau is the smooth versus the striated space, which um, Pierre Boulez talks about as well in his writings on music. But the point is that there is a different way of movement that defines the war machine as opposed to the state. And this is something that, you know, they have so many different dichotomies that mean very similar things. The war machine can be roughly understood as the molecular, whereas the state is the molar. And it's important to note these are not defined by size. You can have a very small state apparatus or a very large state apparatus. You can have a very small war machine or you can have a very big war machine like May 68 in which almost 25% of the French population was collectively engaged in protests and uprisings. The important thing that distinguishes these is the types of movements they effectuate, the ways in which they mobilizes the forces that be and do they try to connect to something new and get outside in order to effectuate some creative movement like the war machine? Or do they try to get outside only to create an ever more expansive form of territory, an ever expansive hierarchy that will envelop more and more space? Now they mentioned that from the standpoint of the state, the originality of the man of war, his eccentricity, necessarily appears in a negative form. Stupidity, deformity, madness, illegitimacy, usurpation, sin. And this is something we can see certainly in the work of Michel Foucault, who's going to talk about the ways in which certain things like madness have been created to maintain a political order, maintain a order of operations, so to speak, instead of calling those operations into question. And they're going to interpret the war machine as this form of eccentricity, that which looks at the order of things and compels them to expand such that they burst. This is almost like a cell and it's encapsulated by a cell membrane and there's this constant force which is compelling that membrane to collapse. And in fact, we don't have to imagine this. This is very much the case. The environment of the organism is constantly needing to be maintained at a certain state and within certain bounds such that a range of ecological tolerance can be maintained. Otherwise, um, if like the pH of the solution the organism is within gets outside of that range, the cell membrane will collapse. So there's always this force of exteriority, which is causing forms to have to actively fight against that. And they mention that it is necessary to reach the point of conceiving the war machine as itself a pure form of exteriority. Whereas the state apparatus constitutes the form of interiority we habitually take as a model, or according to which we are in the habit of thinking. And they're making here a little dichotomy between creativity and habit. The state apparatus is going to constantly be trying to solidify more habits. And this connects to the way in which they speak of the state as functioning via statistical aggregates, or the molar as operating via statistical aggregates. It um, kind of subdues all individuals into a collective abstraction, which is the aggregate of the entire population. You know, this is things like, um, you, you could think of this like GDP treating economics as the statistical aggregate of the entire country. Um, and of course, you could get more and more molecular and you'd see more and more variation in the economics of uh, even the most prosperous countries will have cities that will be very economically unproductive, for example. But they mentioned that what complicates all this is that sometimes the state apparatus can seem like it is using the war machine. 
They say sometimes it is confused with the magic violence of the state, at other times with the state's military institution. For instance, the war machine invents speed and secrecy, but there is all the same a certain speed and certain secrecy that pertain to the state, relatively secondary. So there is a great danger of identifying the structural relation between the two poles of political sovereignty and the dynamic interrelation of these two poles with the power of war. So there is a difference here between the power of war and the war machine, because the power of war is always stuck within these bounds. And really, we can think of the power of war versus the war machine as capitalism versus schizophrenia, which is, of course, the title of both The Thousand Plateaus and Anti-Oedipus, where there's a tendency to effectuate change in order to subsume that change. We could think of this as Hegel, who wants to sublate all contradiction and difference into the one, and this is done teleologically via reason. So there's this force that is propelling everything to get enveloped in this one form, Geist. Whereas the war machine, or schizophrenia, is going to effectuate this change not in order to subsume it, but merely to engage with a new temporality, per se, engage with a new pace of things and a new mode of organization that was not able to appear in the previous form. And thus, it is easy to assume that war and the war machine are the same thing. But the war machine is something which is effectuated by the nomad, for example, who resists very structured political organization. And war can often be used, for example, for imperialism, which is a very structured way of taking the forces possible in the war machine and turning it into something which is strategically used for the purposes of upholding the state instead of constantly keeping the state from coming about. So they say, in short, whenever the eruption of war power is confused with the line of state domination, everything gets muddled. The war machine can then be understood only through the categories of the negative, since nothing is left that remains outside the state. But returned to its milieu of exteriority, the war machine is seen to be of another species, of another nature, of another origin. One would have to say that it is located between the two heads of the state, between the two articulations, and that it is necessary in order to pass from one to the other. But between the two, in that instant, even ephemeral, if only a flash, it proclaims its own irreducibility. The state has no war machine of its own. It can only appropriate one in the form of a military institution, one that will continually cause it problems. And when I hear this talk about war being encapsulated in the state, I'm hearkened back to Michel Foucault's Friendship as a Way of Life, where he talks about the way homosexuality is treated in the military. Men have typically been seen as prohibited from engaging with intimate relations with each other. Yet, nevertheless, we see some of the most intimate moments shared between men of the military. They're in the trenches for weeks on end, or they're um, on a plane or something going into battle, and they're in these very intimate and emotive situations with one another. And Foucault points out how we don't necessarily have to assume that this is homosexuality in the military, but we do see that the sort of way of life, the friendship, the camaraderie that is part of homosexuality, we see that weaponized, for lack of a better word, and used in that sense of camaraderie. Um, even Deleuze and Guattari will talk about esprit de corps throughout, which is this sort of group solidarity that you get, like if you're all on the same team or you're all fighting for the same cause. And here, this is testifying to the fact that 
the state is always trying to incorporate these disparate forces and structure them, whereas the war machine is always engaged in a dynamism which is going to be dependent on the times. We could think of the dynamism of something like Genghis Khan, incorrectly pronounced as Genghis Khan, in which the title derives. The year 1227 is the year in which Genghis Khan died. And that sort of regime was a very different one to something like Spanish or British colonialism, for example. It effectuated very different movements, and Chinggis Khan is largely coming out of a very nomadic way of living, maybe even a pastoral way of living. And as such, there are often these very slippery relations between the state and states, which is to say states as in like states of matter. These are um, instances. So there's always this relation between dynamic forces and the way in which they are taken up and absorbed. Considering these preliminary remarks, they give us the first problem. Is there a way of warding off the formation of a state apparatus or its equivalence in a group? And this brings them to their second proposition. The, exterior, the exteriority of the war machine is also attested to by ethnology. And they're talking here about the state not being defined by the existence of chiefs. They say it is defined by the perpetuation or conservation of organs of power. The concern of the state is to conserve. And, of course, this is setting up that binary between the body without organs and the organs that get instantiated upon it. And they mention Clastre, and they speak of how he invokes this funny reversal where they say just as Hobbes saw clearly that the state was against war, so war is against the state and makes it impossible. It should not be concluded that war is a state of nature, but rather that it is a mode of a social state that wards off and prevents the state. So here they're bringing that dichotomy which I mentioned earlier between the state and states, as in social states, states of matter, um, instantiated particulars which interact with one another. And thus there's always this flip-flop between um, forces and the form of organization that they assume. And they use this very interesting example of Jacques Meunier, I think is how you say his name, and he's talking about um, these children in Bogota that form gangs and the ways in which they try to prevent forms of power from coming about. The ways in which they kind of keep the dynamism of the gang and keep it from becoming just like a state apparatus. And they mention three ways in which Mignard talks about the ways in which these gangs function. The members of the band meet and undertake their theft activity in common, with collective sharing of the loot, but they disperse to eat or sleep separately. Also, and especially, each member of the band is paired with the one, two, or three other members, so if he has a disagreement with the leader, he will not leave alone but will take along his allies, whose combined departure will threaten to break up the entire gang. Finally, there is a diffuse age limit, and at about age 15, a member is inevitably induced to quit the gang. And they talk in a footnote about the different strategies they use, um, these kind of like hazing things they use to make sure that the person leaves at the right time. And of course, this is a diffuse age limit. It's not like a strict age limit that they decided like, uh, like an age of consent kind of thing. It's just kind of, they feel this pull towards formalization. And they don't like that because with that formalization, for example, with the leader, without engaging in this collective pairing of having a few other members on your side, you open yourself to exploitation. You leave a power gap open. 
So by having each person's sense of autonomy connected to a number of others, you have a situation where you can ward off that from happening. But also, that age limit is going to prevent the formalization that comes with socialization that happens as you get older. Uh, they say even in bands of animals, leadership is a complex mechanism that does not act to promote the strongest, but rather inhibits the installation of stable powers in favor of a fabric of imminent relations. And this is what they find so interesting about you know, gangs, these weird collectives. They also talk about high society groups are similar to gangs and operate by the diffusion of prestige rather than by reference to centers of power, as in social groupings. And all of these are going to function not by some formal hierarchical relation, but by imminent relations which are imbued in the very fabric of the way in which they socially interact. You're always kind of in the gang mode, and you're sort of always in this becoming gangster, so to speak. You're always engaged in a relation with things which is going to be led by a sort of dynamism. And this can be kind of dangerous because, for example, gangs, you've always got that immediate presence or that looming presence of the possibility of violence. And the state will ward off such an immediate threat. But someone like Jean Baudrillard will be very apt to tell you that this is only in place for a larger, more looming, and more dangerous form of violence that will threaten us at all times. And they are constantly going to be invoking a number of strategies, one of them being secrecy. And this is something that they're going to see as always penetrating the social fabric. And these are the forces of the war machine in a more concrete instance. I just mentioned the idea of high society groups. We could think of this too as like secret societies. Um, I think of Freemasons is kind of very uh, a popular scapegoat in right-wing media. And these are always going to have a tenuous relation to the state because, as they mentioned before, the state can absorb some of these forces that the war machine uses. And I think of the secrecy of the CIA or the FBI and the ways in which they've been involved in, for example, organized crime in Nicaragua, bringing over crack cocaine in the late 20th century. These are certainly forces of deterritorialization. This is certainly, um, we could call this a creative action in a sense, but it only does so, it only gets out of its territory and gets into something new, not in order to experiment or tinker, but to formalize and structuralize and create this sense of U.S. hegemony, for example. So we can really think of the state versus the war machine as hegemony opposed to heterogeneity. There's a really interesting part of the state, which is that they say the state is what makes the distinction between governors and governed possible. We do not see how the state can be explained by what it presupposes, even with recourse to dialectics. The state seems to rise up in a single stroke, in an imperial form and does not depend on progressive factors. Its on-the-spot emergence is like a stroke of genius, the birth of Athena. And it might sound like they're praising the state here, um, but it's important, again, to note not the formal content of this, but the movement it instantiates. It bears much similarity to the order words that they talk about in the postulates of linguistics. This is something like, I declare war, which necessarily involves an incorporeal transformation of the whole social field. Everyone suddenly shifts and they're either terrified of this imposing force that is imminent, or they're, you know, they're on the 
side that is imposing themselves somewhere else and look at that we're expanding and imperialism this is great and of course they talk about this as an imperial form it's just this sudden onset of a very cancerous sort of force which that idea of a force being cancerous can be both good and bad depending on the way in which it sets up its movements. If this cancerous force infects new areas in order to homogenize it, like capitalism, which tries to turn everything into a commodity, for example, I think of this as like souvenirs in African countries where um, capitalism has basically turned the cultures of these people into commodities and just used it to you know export foreign cheap goods into a saturated market such that you can get a higher profit and exploit that labor all of this is going to be using this cancerous force in a very negative way but you can also use this cancerous force as a way to impose the war machine on the state, a way of infecting forms and causing them to burst from the inside, just like the microorganism I mentioned earlier. They say, what becomes clear is that bans, no less than worldwide organizations, imply a form irreducible to the state and that this form of exteriority necessarily presents itself as a diffuse and polymorphous war machine. And this is bands, not like the instrument bands. This is like bands of strata. The state form as a form of interiority has a tendency to reproduce itself, remaining identical to itself across its variations and easily recognizable within the limits of its poles, always seeking public recognition. There is no masked state. But the war machine's form of exteriority is such that it exists only in its own metamorphoses. It exists in an industrial innovation, as well as in a technological invention, in a commercial circuit, as well as in a religious creation, in all flows and currents that only secondarily allow themselves to be appropriated by the state. It is in terms not of independence, but coexistence and competition in a perpetual field of interaction that we must conceive of exteriority and interiority, war machines of metamorphosis, and state apparatuses of identity, bands and kingdoms, mega machines and empires. And this idea of a perpetual field of interaction, this is the plane of eminence or the plane of consistency that they talk about often. This is this space where it is possible for all sorts of virtual properties to come about, such that um, that incorporeal transformation can happen. Because you might, if you think about it for a second, you know, the statement, I declare war, it's just a bunch of sound waves, right? It, it doesn't necessarily do much on its own. But in a set of other material conditions, it is actually such that it can effectuate a very serious change in the social strata and allow for some new organization to come about, whether that be a effective or ineffective uh, formation. But the important thing here is that there is always this form of exteriority irreducible to the state, and this is the war machine. It's that which cannot be totalized without leaving some sort of mark behind. It's that which can't be encamped around or encircled without leaving some sort of mark. And this exists only through a number of metamorphoses, which is to say, uh, these forms which can often be, I mean, think of Kafka's metamorphosis, where you've got this guy who just turns into like this beetle bug kind of thing. I mean, these metamorphoses can be very strange, and that's part of the excitement of the war machine, is it allows all these interesting forms to come about, which 
the state just doesn't know how to respond to without trying to turn it into some sort of uh, state function. For example, homosexual tendencies amongst men being incorporated as a sort of esprit de corps in the military. In Proposition 3, they say that the exteriority of the war machine is also attested to by epistemology, which intimates the existence and perpetuation of a nomad or minor science. And here, they're basically going to be coming up with two different sciences in a very loose way, one of which is a royal or a legal science, and the other is this nomadic or minor science, or hydraulic science. And they're loosely going through kind of the history of science here and talking about the ways in which we have these very formalized sciences like Euclidean geometry, and we have these other more hydraulic ones, which um, they say, first of all, it uses a hydraulic model rather than being a theory of solids, treating fluids as a special case. Ancient atomism is inseparable from flows, and flux is reality itself, or consistency. So this way in which we have the royal science, which sees forms and hierarchies and substances as primary, whereas the hydraulic science, they point to Democritus and Lucretius, flow is primary. Difference and multiplicity is primary, and out of this, substances form. And they say for this latter type, the model is a vortical one. It operates in an open space through which things flows are distributed, rather than plotting out a closed space for linear and solid things. It is the difference between a smooth vectorial, projective, or topological space, and a striated metric space. In the first case, space is occupied without being counted, and in the second case, space is counted in order to be occupied. And thus, we can see that the ways in which these two models work, smooth, face, smooth space versus striated space, they work in a very different way in order to effectuate different changes. The smooth space occupies space just in order to effectuate change and new movements. Whereas striated space, it tries to count space in order to occupy it with definite forms and definite sorts of hierarchies. And Smooth and striated space might seem very inconcrete on its own, but smooth space consists of vectors, of free association in which various tendencies interact with each other. We can think of this as um, molecular physics or even quantum physics where we've got this bustling change that's always happening. I mean, think of Brownian motion. It's this fundamental vibrating motion that all particles have because motion is what defines everything. If something is completely static, it just doesn't exist anymore. We don't, we don't even know how to talk about absolute stoppage. We only know that there is always this fundamental, I mean, Undecidability in the case of quantum physics on the molecular and kind of submolecular level, and also this intensive dynamism which defines everything. And in smooth space, this is going to allow for rhizomatic change, and this is coming from their idea of the rhizome that they take from botany earlier in the very beginning of this work, which allows for creative change that's not just going to be subsumed in some kind of model. Striated space is about change assuming a secondary relation in relation to an organized plane. Think of this as a kind of undecided space of the smooth space versus 
the Euclidean geometric plane, the you know the vertical and horizontal lines, and you plot points on them. And this tries to impose a space on top of multiplicity in order to make it simple to understand. And they point out the ways in which this required that certain scientific ideas like differential calculus, for example, didn't really fit into these paradigms. And as such, it was considered a gothic hypothesis for a while. And royal science really was only able to improve its status by taking these ideas of the infinitesimal and instantaneous rate of change and heterogeneity and becoming and turning it into static ordinal rules that are imposed. And they say that the state needs to subordinate hydraulic force to conduits, pipes, embankments, which prevent turbulence which constrain movement to go from one point to another and space itself to be striated and measured, which makes the fluid depend on the solid and flows proceed by parallel laminar layers. The hydraulic model of nomad science and the war machine, on the other hand, consist in being distributed by turbulence across a smooth space, in producing a movement that holds space and simultaneously affects all of its points instead of being held by space in a local movement from one specified point to another. And here the state is being identified by this temptation to treat turbulence as secondary, to treat change as something bad. And when they talked about the state as something which conserves earlier, They say that the concern of the state is to conserve. Of course, all the change that is going away from the state, this is going to be viewed as something negative. This is like the tendency to see change as, oh, things are changing too fast nowadays. I wish it was just going back to the good old days when things were nice and pretty. It's like, no. In fact, the state is merely a denial of the fact that things are always changing, especially on a molecular and micro level. We see this with the faster and faster dissemination of information that, for example, with the advent of TikTok, trends, which usually were, I mean, generational, and then they occurred by decades, and then they went from year to year, and then now they can be from day to day, This testifies to the fact that we're always changing. The milieu that constitutes society is always undergoing change. And the state and culture tries to subdue this, oftentimes to the detriment of most people, and assures that the powerful, you know, get a nice little spot in which they can stay. And they use the idea of laminar flow here, which, if you don't know... Laminar flow occurs in which you've got, say, a flow of water coming out of a hose, and it is flowing in such a way that no matter how far you zoom in, the water is all flowing in parallel motion. And when you look at laminar flow, it's this just perfectly crystalline flow. And laminar flow very rarely occurs in nature. It only occurs in such a way that the flow has been constrained through a very precise opening such that it can constitute such a laminar flow. Or when it proceeds with such intensity and bursts out of some point, say, over a waterfall, such that in between two stones or something, it can create a laminar flow. But this laminar flow is always going to be very hard to come about, and if it does, say in a waterfall, it's always being embanked by turbulent flow on all sides, by this vertiginous and just constantly shifting hydraulic or chaotic flow or turbulence.
which is always going to be testifying to just the natural change that's going to occur in nature. And thus, this turbulence, which defines the war machine, it's not going from one specific point to another, but rather being in a state of local movement from one point to another, being in that in-between spot. You're on the way. You have not yet reached some definite end point. And in fact, for Deleuze and Guattari, you won't get to an end point. They are anti-teleological. There is no telos or purpose or set end to which all this change is going towards. Instead, it's just in entertaining creative new forms. Now, in talking about the ways in which people who live resist totalization, they talk about the lobby in political. You know, we have lobbying organizations whose goal is to kind of create a collective assemblage of you give us this much money and we will put that towards a certain politician's campaign and we'll ensure that they get voted in because, you know, money pays. And they say it seems that in many of these collective bodies, there's something else at work that does not fit into this schema. It is not just their obstinate defense of their privileges. It's also their aptitude, even caricatural or serious deformed to constitute themselves as a war machine, following other models, another dynamism, a nomadic ambition over against the state. As an example, there is the very old problem of the lobby, a group with fluid contours whose position is very ambiguous in relation to the state it wishes to influence and the war machine it wishes to promote to whatever ends. And we can think of this as I mean, there are so many lobbying organizations, especially on the far right. I mean, you don't even have to go that far right here in the U.S. to get to, like, Project 2025, for example, which is trying to basically get rid of the state as it exists today in the U.S. and advocate for a sort of unitary executive theory situation they want to like totally redo i mean they posted like a 600 page manifesto about how they're going to totally change the state and this is one of those instances where we have lobbying groups i mean you could think of like the heritage foundation for example these are groups which have this very ambiguous relation to the state they're a part of the way in which the state functions in which campaigns get funded for but they also have this sort of power of upheaval that goes against the state, and thus there's always this kind of weird relation between these organizations and the state. Now, they want to talk about the body, that's call in French, and they say that a body is not reducible to an organism any more than esprit de cal is reducible to the soul of an organism. Because, you know, if you, if you literally translate esprit de cal, it is spirit of the body, or spirit of bodies, or spirit or soul of the organism. But that's not what it's about. Um, esprit de corps is this sense of just collective camaraderie that comes out of very specific conditions. You know, you're in some sort of Cold War hard times, and thus there's this sense of nationalism that comes up, and everyone experiences this sort of collective ecstasy of esprit de cal. And they, they quote this guy Ibn Khaldun, who defines the nomad war machine by families or lineages plus esprit de cal. The war machine entertains a relation to families that is very different from its relation to the state. In the war machine, the family is a band vector instead of a fundamental cell. And they talk about a couple of the different ways in which the family in the nomadic society is not about establishing some hierarchy, but it's about realizing the maximum agnatic solidarity, which is a very funny way of basically saying its potential to effectuate the movement of the nomad society collectively. And thus they talk about 
a secret power or strength of solidarity that pushes the entire nomadic society through the potential to solidify to any one point. But of course, this is not an absolute resistance. Sometimes nomadic societies turn into imperial societies, very hierarchical societies, very sedentary societies, but there's always this slight, just something that can't be absorbed. That, as they say, something always has to spill from the box. They mention that in one of the other plateaus. And they say this has to do neither with the monopoly of an organic power, nor with local representation, but is related to the potential of a vortical body in a nomad space. Of course, the great bodies of a modern state can hardly be thought of as Arab tribes. What we wish to say, rather, is that collective bodies always have fringes or minorities that reconstitute equivalents of the war machine, in sometimes quite unforeseen forms, in specific assemblages such as building bridges or cathedrals or rendering judgments or making music or instituting a science, a technology. So all of these forms that seem to be very stable, Deleuze and Guattari actually want to problematize and say, well, there's always some kind of fringe of the boundary because the state works by drawing this boundary and by turning this boundary into a face like they talk about in the faciality plateau. And these are all ways of kind of figuring out how each thing functions in this general form, this formalized substance, which is the state. But always there's going to be these minorities, these fringes, which have the spirit of the war machine inside them. They testify to something which can't just be subsumed without having some sort of effect. They say, at the limit, all that counts is the constantly shifting borderline. And this is how they're going to define assemblages cultures, societies. This is how they're going to figure out what kind of action is needed in what particular situation. Now, in an effort to concretize their discussion of the state versus the war machine, they use a sort of little binary that they've kind of used before very early in A Thousand Plateaus, where they talked about tracing versus mapping. And these are basically two modes of action. In tracing, you have some kind of model which you use to reference. You trace via the model. And this is basically just reproducing a form. This is what they call it. There's a distinction between two types of science. One which is reproducing, and then the other is following. So in our idea of tracing versus mapping, in mapping, you map your own territory. Mapping is a process which creates a map. It doesn't find a map already, but must map that map. It must create that map. And thus, their idea of reproducing versus following, the way they put it in this plateau, this is not following in like a following a doctrine kind of way, but it's following some sense of change and following the lines that are going to allow for something new to come about. And they say that following is not at all the same thing as reproducing, and one never follows in order to reproduce. They say following is something different from the ideal of reproduction. Not better, just different. One is obliged to follow when one is in search of the singularities of a matter or rather of a material, and not out to discover a form. When one escapes the force of gravity to enter a field of celerity, when one ceases to contemplate the course of a laminar flow in a determinate direction, to be carried away by a vortical flow, when one engages in a continuous variation of variables, instead of extracting constants from them. And this is their big problem with quote-unquote royal science that it assumes that form and constants are the norm and variation is negative or lacking, like they talked about at the beginning. And that the state comes first and everything else is savage. 
But in fact, the nomad, that sense of change, that is primary. That continuous variation of variables, I mean, that's how physics works. Everything is constantly in change. There's an idea in calculus of the differential, which is an instantaneous rate of change. Everything, even in an instant, is always defined by some rate of change, or to those in Guattari, we'll call it a rate of deterritorialization, or a speed of deterritorialization. And thus, they want to go for an ambulant model, the process of deterritorialization that constitutes and extends the territory itself. So it effectuates this kind of the place where we feel at home, our territory, in a very definite manner that's going to allow us to be free. And because they see this dynamism as primary and not secondary, they say everything is situated in an objective zone of fluctuation that is coextensive with reality itself. This is Deleuze and Guattari saying very explicitly that they are realists. They are not idealists. They are postulating a real world, which is independent of the mind, and which creates these zones of fluctuation and allows for organisms to come about like us. And that might seem like a very benign thing to say, but, you know, with like the dominant Hegelianism for a while being all in favor, um, that kind of realism is actually something that's only recently coming back with like object-oriented ontology or like flat ontologies and things like that. And to end this off, they say, due to all their procedures, the ambulant sciences quickly overstep the possibility of calculation. They inhabit that more that exceeds the space of reproduction and soon run into problems that are insurmountable from that point of view. They eventually resolve those problems by means of a real-life operation. So they are telling us something very definite. They are saying these ambulant sciences, which is to say the war machine, those forces of deterritorialization, those creative forces, they are going to overstep the bounds that they have been given by the state, by these stable forms that are already there. And when they overstep in this way, they are testifying to the fact that there is something more there is something creative here which can't be completely totalized. And it's insurmountable from the point of view of the state as it is. Now, Jean Baudrillard will take a very nihilistic approach here and he will say, well, even this more is able to be completely subsumed by capitalism, by the omnipotence of the code that can override everything. But Deleuze and Guattari are going to say that it is an ontological necessity that no code can be completely perfect, that it cannot completely overcode everything. If it could, then we'd have an ontology of the one as some static entity, and we would have no difference. We would have no way of even beginning to talk about being without difference. And they mention that this is going to culminate in a real-life operation, these insurmountable forces are going to build and lead to something like May 68, for example. But this is not teleological, and this is how they differ from Marx. Marx is going to say that these phases of history are going to happen via the sublation of contradictions, which create a new kind of stable state, and this moves teleologically via the forces of history, which is reason, with a capital R. But for Deleuze and Guattari, there is no reason with a capital R. I talked about in my last lecture, there's just a bunch of little reasons. There's a bunch of little kind of ways in which things accumulate and change. And that's not going to be able to be formalized. They mention right here that it will try to be formalized by the state, but it's not going to work without creating something completely insurmountable that's going to lead to the possibility of non-teleological revolution. So I hope this has given you some headway into this very long plateau. I hope you'll consider 
reading this book as well as checking out some of my other lectures on this work and others. Leave any constructive or non-constructive criticism in the comments and I'll see you in another lecture.